Dr. Evita Fernandez is the Managing Director and Senior Consultant of Tradition at Stockholm, Hyderabad with more than three decades of experience. She launched a two-year professional midwifery education and training program and set up the Promise Campaign, which is focused on professional midwifery services. Welcome, Dr. Evita. Priyanka Edikila is the director and co-founder of Birth Village, an independent birth center in Cochin. She is a certified professional midwife and a strong advocate of the midwifery model of care. Welcome. Dr. Vijay Krishnan is the co-founder of Healthy Mother, certified professional midwife and runs the autonomous midwife-led center in Hyderabad with a collaborative model of care. Celestina Cavender is a certified labor doula with over 30 years of experience in helping women and families achieve the birth they desire. She's a mother of six, passionate advocate for women's health and a BBN board member. Welcome, Celestina. Madhvi Lata is a certified childbirth educator and a certified lactation consultant with over 10 years of experience in hospitals around Bangalore. She's a mother and a mother-to-be and a board member of the Bangalore Birth Network. We will be joined shortly by Dr. Lata. Dr. Lata is the senior obstetrician at Rangadore Hospital. She is the secretary of the Bangalore RCOG Trust and former president of the Bangalore Federation of, of Obstetric and Gynecological Services of India. She is a strong proponent for midwifery-led model of care. She will be with us shortly. Um, over to you, Asha. Asha Kilalo is a public health researcher involved in maternal and child health health systems and movements in, in universal access to healthcare. As president and co-founder of the BBN, she has worked with NGOs for several years and served as advisor to the government of Karnataka. Over to you, Asha. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. So I want to thank you all for coming, um, including you know all my friends on the panel. And it's wonderful to be with a group of people who are committed and um, committed to um, I think providing better quality of care and committed to listening, committed to engaging in dialogue and really um, further igniting the change that we all are, are seeing in India, without a doubt. <clears throat> so before we start, so today's format is really meant to be more of a discussion. So the panelists are going to just take a few minutes each to kind of present a core perspective or a core aspect of of um, these issues, and then we really want to open it up and have um, have a discussion. So that's I want I want to keep that in mind, and it's really not meant to be a passive format of a, a lecture and a, that type of thing, uh, which is why also we decided not to use slides and, and things like that. Um, so the objective today is really to. Um, have open-minded dialogue, and I want to stress the open-minded, um, and I want to challenge each of us to think about um, a perspective that doesn't actually fit with us. So, you know, if I hear something and I say, oh, that's not the way I think, I'm really going to force myself to um, open my mind a little wider and to see what I can find in that that I can relate to and validate. So I think that's really important. Um, because we often find ourselves Taking perspectives and models and paradigms, and I come from a, you know a research world partially, and we put those, um, we kind of diametrically oppose these these perspectives, and that's really what we're trying to break through is that we don't need to see urban and rural as different ends of a spectrum. We don't need to see natural and medical as two ends of a, of a you know as two opposites. Um, or private and public necessarily. Now these are useful categorizations, no doubt but we really want to break through all of that. So um, with that in mind, um, let's let's get started. And I think, um, Evita, we're going to ask you if you can start. Yeah. You, you want to tell me why I'm promoting midwifery? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, As an obstetrician, um, and, and I only looked after pregnant women, I thought I was an excellent obstetrician who was very focused and woman-centered. But to my horror, about 10 years ago, discovered that I was far from it. I was, yes, I had good clinical skills, listening skills, I had knowledge, but I honestly did not understand woman-centered care. And when I discovered that, at the same time, 
I was very, very interested in reducing maternal mortality because our hospital had grown into a referral center. And mothers were being sent to us and they were dying on us. So my interest in midwifery started from a different perspective. So we started the program because there was no program in India at that point. And having got into the program, I understood what midwifery was. And my approach to birth and understanding of natural birth took a 180 degree turn. And I realized I had to change. And India needs professional midwives with 22 million births and violence in terms of obstetric violence, respect and abuse being all across private and public institutes. I said I couldn't continue doing what I was doing. So that is why I'm here today as an obstetrician. And I've been doing this now for the last few years, promoting midwifery, professional midwifery, helping the government train nurses into midwives in a district hospital. And thanks to the UK midwives, we've got Indy, who's devoted two years of her life to help us promote professional midwifery. I want you to understand, all of us obstetricians have been trained this way. Majority of us are not aware that we're doing the wrong thing. And unless we stop, listen to voices of women, reflect, we could be cruising along, patting ourselves on the back like I did for two decades, thinking we're doing a great job. We are excellent surgical skills, and I'm convinced we need to refrain from looking after the low-risk mothers. We need to get out of that arena, get professional midwives in to take over low-risk mothers. We work together with midwives when we are called in to help and jointly support mothers through natural birth. Example, a VBAC lady wanted a water birth. We work together on that and she enjoyed a perfect water birth. Did she, if she had asked me this 10 years ago, I would have said, rubbish, no way. But today, uh, we've also helped women, two previous sections, have a natural birth, which I would never have thought of 10 years ago. I'll only end by saying, with the evidence of the long-term impact on babies born through C-sections, or wherever there's unnecessary use of oxytocin, and we've become horribly interventional here. These babies are going to suffer long-term effects. There's enough evidence about that. So we are nurturing a generation that's not going to be healthy. So we need to stop. And as an obstetrician, I'm on the side of women and professional midwives tell you that I've done a 180 degree turn. Because these babies that we are pulling out of women's bodies through sections, their immunity is going to be screwed up. There's going to be an increase of eczema, asthma. There's a suggestion that these babies may have a higher incidence of autism. So we really need to stop. And we need women to scream and demand better care. Thank you. Um, and Evita really, uh, I think, you know, as we break into discussion in a little bit, your, you know, the specifics of some of your experiences through Fernandez hospitals and elsewhere, of course, and mm -hmm. other you know, ways would be really yeah. helpful. Um, Vidya, so this is Vidya Krishnan, and um, I'm going to ask Vidya to 
So um, thank you for this opportunity and this wonderful platform here. And I think we have a wonderful mixture of audience as well. And um, it's wonderful to sit together with such a great panel of people who are all trying to improve the way we provide maternity care in India today. So um, my, I'm going to talk a little bit about the model of care, the midwife-led model of care, which we have been practicing for over 10 years now. Um, it is a midwife-led autonomous birth center with a collaborative model of care that we practice. And um, a little bit about the background that we came into this with um, in 2007 when, we, when I started looking at how maternity care was provided, um, it was evident to me that it, was, uh, it needed a sea change. There was no question, there was no respect, no dignity, no autonomy of care, no ability for the women to make choices. And at that point of time, there was, to the extent that we now have at least, it's like almost a tipping point where now women and families are, are understanding of, uh, you know, lamas and healthy birth practices and midwifery mod models of care, at least a little bit, at that point there was nothing. So we started with Lamas classes, and women would come to us thinking that they are going to go through exercise classes and yoga, and they would leave um, feeling that they uh, they actually have a voice and maybe a choice in the way that they could actually, you know, birth their babies. But then what also happened simultaneously was that they would go back into the same medical system. And when in that medical system, a number of them, and I would say in the first year, 80 to 90% of our first class, first women who attended the Lamas classes landed up with interventions and unnecessary cesarean sections. Um, that led to you know us talking to people. And what we realized was that and to me, as a midwife, I think one thing is very clear, that birth, for the better part, is a physiological process. And you heard the doctor in the video talking about that 80% of, you know, women, you know, have, or the 80% of the time you spend with, you know, excellent, you know, normal births, and then a little 2% or whatever lands up being terror. So yes, there is a component of, um, emergency care that is needed, but we wanted to give women that platform where they would have that undisturbed birth that they desire, where their voices would be heard, where they would be looked at more than a mere number, where they would be their, their, uh, their circumstances, where the, phys the physical, the physiological, the emotional, the social, everything would be looked at as a midwife is trained to look at for. So this was where we started. And uh, from my perspective, I also knew that we could not push the uh, emergent needs into, you know, under the rug. We knew that emergencies would arise. So then this came to a point where we had to look at alternatives. I did want a birth center because that was really that out of hospital birth that we were looking for. But we also wanted to have a good collaborative model of care where in case of an emergency need, we would be able to offer the woman that um, safety net, so to speak, and we would have the on site the expertise of obstetricians and gynecologists and other team members as they needed. Um, so that's how the, we had the Sanctum Birth Center came into place in 2009. And we had lots of discussions, Dr. Jayanti, my uh, now partner, we had lots and lots of discussions about how this would be brought into place. How would we meld the best aspects of the midwifery <coughs> model of care and the best aspects of the obstetric model of care and provide the services in a way that was respectful. So also for us, we needed to understand what were our strengths, what were her weaknesses, what were the uh, professional boundaries that we would have to you know, go back and forth with, what were the referral systems that would be put into place, when would I be able to say that I can take care of a woman autonomously, and when would I refer to her knowing that this would be something that would need a collaboration. And that's how we, we landed up talking and the birth center came into place. And the only other thing that I want to talk about is over the last 10 years, one thing is that my life has been filled with the resonant voices of women and their families who have told over and over again that this is what they want. They want respectful care. They want the voices to be heard. They want to make choices and they want autonomy of decision making. They want a care provider who will allow them and sit with them as a family member and give them that encouragement that yes, they can do it. And of course, women in birth need strong women. 
I have no no absolutely as a midwife this is what we work and work with that women need strong women and these strong women should have the skills should have the ability to make good decisions they have to have education they have to have qualifications behind them but they also have to have a heart and with that heart we work with the women day and night to get them the birth that they want and this is what midwifery to me is all about but our center works on because we will have the collaborator model we are also able to work with the higher risk women and do we do the you know the diabetes or hypertension or twins and we have done breech births as well but it has come with the knowledge that we have excellent obstetricians on site which we could not do without thank you Vijaya's center in Hyderabad is really unique in that way, I would say, right, Vijaya? Of having this collaborative model. And um, it's, it's a great, really rich experience that we need to learn from. Um, I'm Priyanka um, to speak next. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, it's really, really nice to be part of this panel and to be in Bangalore. I just had a time when I'm back and I want to change the Bangalore. I'm half of that reach or that I won't reach in history. Just before the panel started. So, yeah, so I think for me, I would have to start from a small, in two small incidents that happened in 2007. Um, I just about started off as a mass chapter of educator. And it is very interesting because I went to at least 10 or 12 different institutions, big institutions in my city, with the curriculum that I had to teach. And I was rejected by all 12. The reasons that they told me were, you have to either change your curriculum, or you must promote Equidura, or I must have a huge drastic change in the way I look at the subject. And I declined all three. There was this one last institution that I walked out of, and just as I was leaving, they had the institution asked me just one last question. They asked me, do you believe in this or not? The healthy birth practices, what we are all talking about a lot for the past 10 years. And I said, yes, I do. And I left. And from there, I started with an independent childbirth educator. Um, and in two, that was one incident that really opened my eyes to what really was happening in maternity care with respect to choice. One. The second thing I saw was in 2010, uh, there was this mother in my, one of my classes who said, I'm really interested in having the birth the way I conceive it to be. And I thought, why not? And that is when I was also researching for midwives and the kind of care they um, led in hospitals, out of hospitals. And I collaborated with the midwife, um, Red Miller, at that point in time, and worked. Uh, for a birth inside a hospital at home. Again, there were two things that opened my eyes again in 2010. One was she had a great birth, there's no doubt about that. But there was one thing that I was appalled at was there was around 40 or 50 medical personnel inside all watching her vagina, which was a bit difficult for me. I could, I'm still not forgotten the gasp that they had when in. As a midwife, we always encourage women to eat and drink in labor. It's only normal that you will definitely release your bowels when you're about to have a baby. But they were also a bowel and I found, and I could literally hear their dust. And it was very, very difficult. At the same time, there was another incident that happened simultaneously. There was another baby um, who was a full-term baby, but who had anomalies. And that baby, it, the family initially made a choice for that mother that she would not see or hold the baby and that baby was left alone there while the mother was wheeled out. And everybody literally from the, I think from the nurse to the janitor, everybody would come and look. And I also saw how, how there was no dignity even when this little human being was spending his last hour of life on this baby. And it really shook me. And I made my decision then and there that we will begin a facility which is strongly catering to women and their choices, where she will have a say in how she wants to have this baby or not have this baby. And that's how Birth Village was born. 
Today, we stand as a facility where we um, provide prenatal care, we provide birth services. Um, we cater specifically to low-risk healthy mothers only, because that, well, we, that's exactly what we specialize in. Uh, we're looking at uh, women who are um, healthy. When I say healthy, we're looking at women who um, are free from gestational diabetes, hypertension, because by, simply by the word trip, we are not a hospital birth center. And that's what suits the birth center. Now, keeping this in mind, uh, we also are quite strict about the numbers. Now, we also believe that every woman must receive a midwife and continuity of care. This is very important for us. So in order to maintain this, we stick to around 10 births a month. This is what we do. And we think, okay, 10 births a month, and you know, our institutions as such, when we look at other hospitals, is a bigger number. But when we look at one midwife to one woman, the ratio, it works really well holistically, and we're able to give her complete care. This is, again, an important facet about our center. Now, another thing I think which is unique about uh, the center is we have our, is our postnatal care. So after the, the mothers have the babies and they go home within 24 hours or so, we continue with uh, visits at her house. She receives visits from the midwife at her house, say close to four or five visits at her house, and maybe around four or five visits to the center, which, is, which goes up to six weeks. And I think this is quite luxurious because she's very she say, she often says she feels like a princess people are coming and visiting her and the baby and seeing how she and the baby is doing so it really works so in a way it's community midwifery that's what it is and uh, with respect to statistics um, i think this is something i found unique in most birth centers is that most birth centers world over have really good outcomes around 95 96 percent is a natural birth rate um, we're doing quite well as far as statistics is concerned um, my And having said that, now, at today, when I sit here in this panel, my thoughts are a bit different. I really wish to see how this can be expanded forward for the country. I think this is very important. Why midwifery for India? I think because India's women deserve the best. And I think every single woman deserves a midwife. There's no doubt in my mind about this. I'm very clear about this. Um, and I think that... This, the one country that has said this very strongly is Germany. Germany says very clearly that a woman can birth without a doctor, but not without the midwife. They have clear, it's very clear for them. And we do need our doctors. There's no doubt about that. They are super skilled when it comes to surgeries. In fact, we have some of the best surgeons across the globe. But when we have a one is 2,800 ratio, and again, another experience that I had was in ICM, when I attended last year, we are the second in the world in terms of population. We have around, I think, uh, 1.73 million nurses and around 7,86,000 like, nurses, uh, sorry, auxiliary nurse midwives registered in this country. When I went for the ICM, I was stunned because there were so many women marching and waving their flags, and there was hardly next to one or two from India as practicing midwives. Even Pakistan has a presence over there. Sri Lanka has a great presence over there. If you look at the midwives from Bali, they're these tiny women, but by golly, their spirit is outstanding. You know, we are nowhere, we are so nowhere, and we really need to bring midwives back. The last point that I have is that, we're talking today about autonomous midwifery. It's one of the topics, I think, coming up in the panel. I think we have, some, we have forgotten that all of us sitting here are products of a generation of women from villages who actually did work independently and autonomously. We're just reusing these words which actually existed in our community once upon a time. And it's so important that autonomous, independent voices of women, of care providers, are heard. And it's very easy to silence these voices, but I think it's time to start listening to them. Thank you so much. I just wanted to say that um, that was really good. Thank you for sharing all those um, perspectives and, um, and and the stories always speak to us. You know the stories. Um, while we use a lot of language and you know and clinical work and research, um, but it's really the stories that give us the the substantive um, nature of what's happening. And um, I, I I think. The, the last point you made about continuity of care and, and you know that 
these, you know, there's certain um, resources that existed in communities and we are losing them. And I want to recognize that because although today's discussion really focuses on um, um, professional clinical work, um, we, we do recognize the, the very important role that traditional guys have, have played. Um, and I know that can sometimes be wrought with certain issues um, with respect to safety or practices and, and things like that, traditional practices. But um, I did very intensive field work for more than 10 years and um, have actually seen um, a couple of cases of women die right in front of me. So, you know, it's not something I like to remember, but it's something I can't forget at the same time, just to actually see women and, and, and newborns. Um, and that's because we have really silenced these guys. We have not really incorporated them. I mean, there are a few examples in the country here and there, but for the most part, we have not incorporated them into any of the service programs that are existing in the country and um, many places are really not served by the formal health system appropriately. And so coverage is, is still an issue. So I just wanted to, um, that kind of came up when you said that. Um, I want to ask Dr. Lata Manajama to speak. Lata, we introduced you when you <laughs> so <laughs> pretty to me, um, but we're really happy to have you. And um, thank you. Please thank you. Mic. I should say good evening to everybody. Um, very heartened to be here on this panel because we are groping again, finding common grounds to promote midwifery care. Evita has worked extensively, and all of you on the panel and the panelists here have worked extensively in this field. But have we? made the way or are we getting anywhere is the question. See, 23 years ago, when I came back from UK, I thought, why are we not having midwives <coughs> to care for our women? But even to this day, it is very sad to see that as doctors, we still continue to deliver women in our centers. So what have been the barriers to this care or to develop midwifery-led uh, units in our country? I think I have to say without much embarrassment or with embarrassment that obstetricians themselves are one of the barriers to care very sorry to say this, but Fatima, I don't know whether you would uh, agree with me. Evita, I don't know whether you would agree. Okay. Obstetricians, I think we feel that even low risk deliveries are in our domain and it is bread and butter for obstetricians. So are we prepared to let go of the low risk obstetrics to midwives. I think we should, and we should let go of low risk mid deliveries to midwives, and we should be able to support, complement rather than compete, should be the policy of obstetricians. Excuse me. Many times when we have had doula or midwives coming from BBN and yeah, to our um, centers and other visiting consultants have seen um, doulas or midwives man managing deliveries and if, um, I mean, well, they would ask us, well, why do you want to encourage these people? In this unit because this is a doctor-led, I mean, they wouldn't use the terminology doctor-led unit, but this is supposed to be managed by doctors and the women also expect the doctors to be around and 
why do you allow duelists etc to manage labors and if the lady got into problem or the child got into problem if there were to be any intrauterine problems who would take the responsibility would you be able to take the responsibility and anyway we try to get duelists manage our labor wards um, a few years ago um, through a UK based um, what can I say the collaboration work but unfortunately these questions who is going to manage I mean especially from visiting consultants would put people off and also put our staff off so that was the problem. That was one of the barriers to care. I'm going to talk about barriers to care mainly, briefly, hopefully. <clears throat> and women and family, okay, they are also another barriers to care. The doctor who has seen, the specialist or the super specialist who has seen the lady throughout pregnancy should be there for the delivery. We run a group practice and we are six consultants, but it is difficult to make them accept other consultants attending their delivery. So a lot of communication has to happen, a lot of counseling has to happen even before another consultant attended, let alone midwife, accepting a midwife. And also it has become a prestige issue for women to deliver in particular institutions where the doctors cater the care, the super specialists cater the care rather than midwives. And they, uh, I mean, the institutions also advertise it in a big way that all the deliveries are attended by specialists and super specialists. Are we going in the right direction? Are these the barriers to care? I mean, to midwifery care? And also, if centers are promoting cesarean sections, then you are moving away from midwifery care, respectful <coughs> care for women. <coughs> Insurance, it doesn't cover midwif midwives. Indemnity-wise, I don't know what's happening. But definitely, if they are going to be delivered by midwives, <coughs> and if they are going to be the signatories, for the medical claim, they don't accept it. It has to be a doctor. So these are some of the barriers. And moving on, medical legally, an, an obstetrician should be able to complement and support the midwife in times of emergencies. If she sort of, sh she or he shirks out and says, look, it's a last minute transfer. I don't want to take the medical legal responsibility. I don't want to be assaulted. See, medical legal problems have gone up nearly 400 folds in our country. So are we safe with midwives delivering? Yes, we are safe. But how do we make the law more stringent to support midwives? Is there a political will, okay, to especially in the rural areas to support midwives? It's very, very important. And also, whoever calls themselves as midwives, are they doing the right things? OK. In the name of midwifery, are they doing the right things, especially in the rural areas? Also, even in rural areas, we are seeing lots of small nursing homes coming up <coughs> where doctors are catering midwifery care. I wouldn't say midwifery care. Uh, care during uh, labor, if at all labor happens. That's what I have to say. Yeah. So there are lots and lots of barriers to care. So over the last 23 years, have I made any remarkable progress? It's very, very doubtful. Because the system, though we have done it in a very small way, the system has not sort of allowed us to do things. And also, for example, corporate setups, if we wanted to have a midwifery unit, 
when I was heading the fortis, I put forth this, put forth a midwifery unit as one of the priorities. But they were not very willing because they wondered who will take the medical legal responsibility, whether the care, the standards of care will be maintained, and whether the other consultants will accept it and things like that. So lots and lots of barriers to care. So how do we address this? I think this forum would be a good forum to see how we can complement as obstetricians and midwives in caring for women. It's very, very important that we bring in this change. There is no doubt about it. If you saw other countries, I really feel sad. Why should our women suffer like this, not get optimal care? Why should we medicalize the pregnancy? It delivery, pregnancy and delivery are privileged functions, and a woman, woman is designed to get pregnant and deliver most of the time normally and have respectful care. Why are we making it pathological? So all these are barriers to care. We have to see how best we transcend these barriers to give women the best. Thank you. Thank you, Lata, and a lot of really important issues there, really practical and policy barriers, um, legal insurance, um, acceptance, acceptance within, you know, um, among birth professionals, acceptance by yep. um, women and families, because you're right, there, that, that's also one aspect of it. Um, and I think a lot of education and awareness is needed. Um, I'm now going to ask um, Celestine Cavender to speak. Thank you. Thank you, and hi, everybody. Sorry, I put my glasses on. <laughs> um, OK, I've been a doula for the last 30 years. And I really respect Dr. Latha, what she just said. Um, a doula is, a, is a, uh, basically a woman servant. So I'm a servant to the mother. And having my own kids um, kind of motivated me all the more to be more passionate about what I do. Um, just coming back to one point which the doctor was saying about why are doulas a threat to the doctors? <coughs> Here we are actually making things as simple as possible for the mother to birth naturally and normally. And we don't do any medicals, so we actually should be working as a team to be able to help that mother to, to deliver that baby. You know? But yes, there is resistance in the hospitals with the OBGs. It's not very easy. Um, so, sorry, just to get my points. So there are two different types of doulas. One is a labor doula, which I am, and the other one is a postpartum doula. There is another one also, which is also called the comfort doula, which, uh, which actually is, um, if in case there's a death, the doula, actually comfort doula, comforts the mother and is trained for that. So a doula is professionally trained in childbirth, who provides emotional, physical, and educational support to a mother who's expecting and experiencing labor. A doula's role and purpose is to help the mother to have a safe, memorable and empowering birthing experience, which includes, sorry. Okay, an empowering birthing experience, and this has a positive impact on the labor process. The labor process actually is reduced when the mother has positive input. My relationship with the mother begins when she is few months into labor. In, sorry, into, into the delivery, where I can actually help her. We kind of bond a relationship. We get to know each other. If she has any fears, she's able to open up, talk about it, which unfortunately with the OBG, she doesn't have that opportunity to open up, talk about her fears, because time is limited with the doctor's appointment. I really also appreciate Dr. Fatima, who's actually gives that mother that opportunity to birth at her own space, her own time. Hi. 
As a doula, we provide comfort with pain relief techniques, include breathing techniques, relaxation techniques, massages, and share with them the different laboring positions. Again, that's a big, big topic here, laboring positions. We very much encourage the partner to get involved in the pre-preparations, which include prenatal classes, which is very important. And it's also reassuring for the mother and for the husband as well. The goal of a doula is to help the mother experience a positive and safe birth, whether an unmedicated birth or a cesarean. As a doula, we do not provide medical care. After the birth of the baby, the doula will spend time with the mother to begin her breastfeeding journey and the bonding between new baby and the family. Studies have shown that having a doula as a member of a birth team decreases the overall labor by 25 to 30%. So we actually need more doulas, please, here in, in India. Thank you. Yes. Tina, thank you so much. Uh, really, really important perspective. And there are so few labor doulas actually mm -hmm. um, available. So um, it's a really important area that we need to bring into these discussions. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Malavi Lata to speak, who's a childbirth educator. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I am a LAMA certified childbirth educator and also a certified lactation consultant. So um, initially, I started as uh, wanted to do prenatal yoga classes because my basic qualification is uh, physiotherapist. So I wanted to do prenatal yoga classes. As I started this, then I realized that women need to understand what labor is all about or what about what is that they have to expect. It is not just about uh, being physically prepared, but I, I found that many women do not even know the choices that they have. They are going to blindly put themselves <coughs> in the hands of the doctors and say, okay, whatever you do, I am ready for it. And this is where I felt women should really know what, what are interventions and what is a natural birth. People are really not aware of what a natural birth can be. When I talk about uh, episiotomy is not required or epidural anesthesia is not required, where you can try and you know do breathing, they are quite surprised. And they are really unaware of the whole thing. And that's where my Lama's education helped me to empower and educate women about this. And this is uh, education, like, you know, um, these are well-educated professional women who absolutely have no idea about birthing. So they, they think what doctor tells, what the gynecologist tells is the ultimate. They have no choice or they, they don't even know that they have a choice or they can raise a voice. Ask the doctor that, okay, can I do this? Can I do that? No, they, because they are highly unaware of the whole process of birthing. And that's where the Lama's education helps in empowering and educating them saying them okay that this is a choice this can be a possibility in birth and you can this is your body you have to take control and you have to be like you know capable of or uh, being aware of your body and asking the doctor that okay is it a possibility or can i at least give it a try so that's what is uh, my basic work and i am seeing that a lot of women are slowly asking or raising voice and asking their gynecologist to provide certain kind of care. It could be a very simple change in the way that uh, they are getting the care, but it is making a good difference and that's what I feel very happy about. And ultimately what I realized is that whatever I'm teaching as a Lama's educator, it is not being implemented in the hospitals because Bangalore does not have any birth center and we really need a birth center and a midwife or a midwifery model of care because people do not even know that a model of care like midwifery care exists. Now in India we have only one autonomous care that has to be a gynecologist in a corporate hospital. That's all. So uh, my, my effort is to educate women on saying like, you know, uh, uh, telling them that there is another model of care which is possible, but 
where i find challenging is that there is nobody who is providing that care except for few dr uh, lata and uh, dr Rev, um, fatima punawala other than that i don't see anybody who is doing any kind of natural birthing in bangalore so uh, may i request dr revita and uh, dr vijaya to please come to bangalore and extend your services here we really really need your expertise here and uh, we also need your uh, you know the midwifery care and more of doulas and more of obstetricians who believe in natural birthing that's all i want to say thank you Thank you, Madhvi. Um, again, really important issues around childbirth education because it is really a key component um, in transforming how care has to happen. Um, we, we have a couple of other people who actually wanted to speak. I think is Usha. Yeah, Usha is there. Yes. Hi. Hi. So, um, Megha, you want to make an introduction? Okay, fine. You have it here. She would be able to introduce herself. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you do that? She can do she that. Usha, would you like to sit, sit here? here. Yeah. No, no, no. Please. I'm Usha Everybody. And uh, I was saying that we should have a natural birthing center in Bangalore. Um, we started a natural birthing center in Indore. It's a small center. Um, and what made me to start it was, you know, uh, I, I just, I had two ladies who came to me. Earlier, we had started <coughs> a counseling center way back in 2012. I am a member of Somi Society of Israel India. And also, uh, we have a chapter, um, Indore chapter of Society of Israel India. So every time we would attend conferences, we would say we should do this, we should do that, but we were not doing anything. So we said, let's start a birthing uh, counseling center from the college. So we, we run a nursing college, which has BSc nursing, MSc nursing, and a PhD nursing also. But we thought uh, there will be two uh, benefits. One, women will get one-to-one -one with the uh, that counseling, and the second will be uh, our own students will also learn. So that we started, again we started another one, and we were motivated. And then during this time, I had uh, had two ladies who came to me, my own small daughters, my daughter's friends. Uh, one had a very good experience. Um, she was in Australia, she and her husband. Throughout pregnancy, she was with the midwife, she had all the care, and she never saw the face of a doctor, obstetrician in Australia. There are uh, midwife run centers. So her own mother, who is a doctor with us, she told me, why do you talk to Gurjan? She, she had such a good experience. You are already running a counseling center, and we can think of it. During this time, there was another lady who was a physiotherapist with us. She had gone to UK. They were postgraduate <coughs> in the US. And she had heard about all this. And she went to Vijay Krishnan to learn. She and her husband, they were in New they wanted to, she wanted to have a normal natural birth by her own efforts. So she went to learn Lamas from Vijay Krishnan, came back. I didn't know that thing. She went to one of the doctors and she told the doctors, uh, I want to have my own decision when I have the birth, etc., etc. The doctor promised, okay, you will have that. But when she came for delivery, that particular doctor was not their senior doctor, some junior was there. So that junior doctor, and she came, she said, okay, you lie down, she put a drip. She said, I don't need a drip, but she put the drip. Then she put the continuous monitoring. She was asked to lie, lie down. She said, I don't want to lie down, I want to walk around. That is what I have been taught. She said, no, no, uh, you need this. Then she says, she came to do my PV examination and I saw an instrument in her hand. Mm -hmm. Then it, she, she was out of her distinction. She said, stop. These days, no patients can tell the doctor to stop. But she told her to stop. I will not allow you to do this. My membranes will rupture when they are going to rupture. So that doctor got very angry. She called up the doctor, senior doctor. She said, your patient is behaving like this with me. She said, okay, okay. Leave her, let her 
do whatever she wants to do. I will send another doctor. So another doctor was told, counsel, that don't do anything. Let her take the decision. So she did take this decision. And she had her baby, little problem. So both of these babies, when they came to, I, I invited them. With my team, they sat there with me. And they told their own experiences. So that was the day I thought, in the all needs a natural birthing center. So we started the natural birthing center. And we have the same problem, Dr. Lata, that the barriers, obstetricians, our patients, ours is a part of corporate hospital, a private hospital, and um, patients are admitted under doctors, although in my center we call them mothers and not the patients, but still the doctor will come to <coughs> deliver the patient because patient, they feel that uh, we are paying to the consultant and consultant only has to do the delivery, although we call it work and we don't call it delivery and they are there and they have all those bad habits, push, <laughs> doing their physiotomy, not align the uh, <laughs> companion with the mother and uh, not align them to take fluids or anything, all those things. But still, my team, I am fortunate that I have to, uh, my own teaching staff as well as the midwives who are little assertive, they have learned to be little more assertive and they stop the doctors from doing these things and uh, they, they don't listen. We, we had those girls there in the uh, Tomi conference. Uh, very, very slowly we are going up and uh, few changes are there. So I'm a little happy with that, although I'm not fully satisfied. Um, things are happening in a proper, you know, slightly. It will take a long time. People's mindsets and the doctor's mindsets. <coughs> Dr. Abita Fernandez also visited us and I saw to it that you meet the doctors. She also, she also said, unless a doctor tells a doctor, they will not listen to me, right? They will not listen to me. But she, she talked to the doctors and our doctor Sony is a little better now. The gray hair helps. And one very good thing, Dr. Abita, I want to tell you. Only therefore yesterday, one gentleman from the Ministry of Health, the people, um, Ministry of uh, Family and uh, Welfare, Dr. Mehta Singh came. He is under, uh, um, you are telling me the name of the doctor who is the Deputy Commissioner? Um, Dinesh Veswal. Dinesh, Dinesh, yes, Veswal, Dinesh Veswal. Dinesh Veswal sent him to us to see our center. Uh, and he sent a letter to me. I told him, please send me a letter, not just WhatsApp and then talk to some official is coming from. Um, government of India, uh, my people will say, who is, why, how did you call? So Dinesh sir sent a letter saying that he wants to learn what you are doing. Can we uh, replicate it into a larger community, especially this thing, uh, periphery and all that? Um, we showed him the place, we showed him everything that we were, we are doing. He has gone back, he says, I will prepare a report. I, I told him about uh, your Fernandes Hospitals, Telangana uh, Government, uh, relief reports. Because what we are doing, we can do two things. Counseling the mothers is going on, but this education part also, we can also do it because we have a college. So uh, I told him he didn't know, uh, but then I will send back to that, okay, uh, you people are already doing in Telangana, if you want to do it some other places also. So uh, I'm, I'm really happy that Dr. Rebecca came. Vijaya, Vijaya had come long back in 2005 or something. Uh, she had motivated us about the, her own birthing center. And I sent my girls to learn from them. Then we started our birthing center. So anyways, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Usha. That's really inspiring. And uh, it's great that, uh, I mean, if New York can start, so many places can start. So we need to see this uh, expand. So we'd like to um, just open up for discussion, uh, questions, comments, um, and I'm hoping that um, we'll also hear from Indy. Indy Kaur is here. She's a really experienced midwife from the UK and has been working with Avita in, in um, Hyderabad and in Karimnagar, um, in, uh, right? Um, with the training there. So, and. Fatima Punohala is here, who's always been, you know, I think for the last 15, 20 years, been committed to, to really changing birth in Bangor. 
So, and everybody else. So please feel free um, to ask and say pretty much anything um, respectfully, of course. <laughs> Some of y'all are mentioning about choices. Uh, you know, we do have women who read a lot from Google. Come the birth plan, like a choice. You know, if you go to a cafeteria and you want coffee, you want tea, you want tea with milk, you want coffee with no sugar. So I think this really puts us off. Uh, uh, I mean, to me, you you know, you like you take a flight, you choose the right airlines. You're sure, go to the track record, and then you leave it to the pilot. You don't tell the pilot how to drive the plane. So the same thing, I think, when women come, you know, asking for choices, they should choose their obstetrician and then leave it to us. Trust is a fundamental thing when we can perform best as a caregiver. Whether, you know, you work in the rural or private care, but I think trust building is of course the obstetrician's duty, but the sorry, but the women too have to give us that trust to perform the best. What I find in the corporates that women have this thing: I'm paying, and I will decide what I want. It doesn't work like that. Some of us have given up corporate care to start our own birthing center, where ultimately I take the responsibility. And the women who come to, sorry, the women who come to us should understand that uh, you know when we take the responsibility that to trust us and let us perform the best i think i have one of the a few uh, i mean my section rate i take pride in all because the women who come to us trust us i i i have a place which is surrounded by corporate hospitals mine is a very simple place so whenever somebody walks into my clinic i know that she wants something different not corporate care, and I think that makes us perform. So I think as, uh, I don't know what uh, Lata feels an editor, but the trust is the fundamental thing which makes us perform very well. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. Fatima, <laughs> I, I am afraid I don't fully agree with all that you said. Trust is important trust between a woman and a midwife, trust between a woman and the obstetrician. But what I've learned over the last few years with midwifery is we need to hear that woman. It's her birth. How would she like her birth to be? We give her the right information. Um, Quite often, we obstetricians are afraid. And we are afraid to give women the space to make those choices. If somebody wants a vaginal breach birth, I should be able to look into her eyes with fear, without fear, but honestly say, I may not be able to do that for you because I don't have the experience. But Maybe you'd like to go to somebody else for that, to exercise that choice. Um, I'm, I'm just using that as a very simple thing. But I feel it's important we go through a birth plan, talk. If it doesn't work because of blah, 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 do you trust that we make the right decision for you and your baby? I feel it's time we obstetricians give women that space. Because I think it's very important to understand women, do her at home, and see what she wants, what she doesn't want. And if you have built that sort of rapport, if plan A has not worked, and if you explain that, look, plan A is not working, and we should go to plan B, 
I think most of them would accept us. More and more I think about what we have done in the past few decades, I feel we have done more of glorified hodgepodge midwifery rather than, yeah, in low safer for them to deliver with midwife rather than the specialists or super specialists who will medicalize the pregnancy. I think uh, people like um, Evita, Vijaya, BBN, etc. How, how much can we be involved with women education to accept midwifery in low risk pregnancies is what would be um, the important issue. It is not only you have to give up, but if the woman chooses to go to a midwife, then the obstetricians wouldn't have a big role to play if it is a low-risk pregnancy. So I think education, empowerment of women is very, very important in accepting midwifery care. And also institutions providing midwifery care is also another important aspect. Don't know what people feel. There's just one, maybe one small incident I can put with that. Is there was one mom who we saw on her list when we take the intake history. She mentioned she switched care ten times by the fifth appointment or so. She's probably, you know, what we call, what we read in Google as doctor shopping, right? And when she came in for appointments, at least I think we saw her four times, and all the four times she never um, allowed us to touch her belly. She just never allowed us to touch her belly at all. <coughs> and that is kind of, you know, you as a care provider, you feel, okay, is she putting, why is she doing this, and uh, what is it that's making her refrain? But on the sixth visit when she came in, she came alone and she said, I would like you to feel my baby. And then we, she just lifted her, her salvar top up. It's quite evident that her belly was full of stamp marks. Basically, she was suffering violence in pregnancy, which is why she was refusing to show herself to anybody. And it took her that time to really and everybody was judging her that she was putting on a show and things like that, but that was so much far from the truth. And it really takes us a lot to create that space for a woman of abuse to open up. It really takes a lot. And there's sometimes more that meets the eye, and we just can't write women off just like that. There must be something a way more deeper than that. Yeah. Ma'am, I would want to say that when you say about the trust factor, um, it is the trust when um, the doctors or the gynecologists are doing cesareans where it is really a medical reason, ma'am. And uh, most of the times I see that the cesareans are happening because of convenience or because of time constraint. This is what is happening. And um, because I am, I'm. Uh, uh, educating women from past 10 years and most of the times I see that the gynecologists who are not really pro natural birthing they are either uh, midway through okay fine if it is normal fine if it is cesarean it's also fine and many gynecologists are pro cesarean they start preparing women from 28 29 weeks onwards saying that it could be a c-section around 36 37 weeks this is what is the um, uh, you know reducing the trust on the gynecologist mom. But if the gynecologist is really pro-natural birthing, they are trying to educate or, you know, really uh, guide women right from day one. 
be it on the lifestyle or be it on the diet or be it on the weight gain they are guiding the women in all the aspects it's not just looking at the baby's growth and all so that kind of uh, comprehensive or holistic care is what is missing i feel and the most of the cesareans happen because of comfort or convenience or the time constraint that is what is increasing the cesarean rate and it is got nothing to do with the trust factor so they all trust their gynecologist so much that they fail to look at uh, around the other factors and that's when uh, the gynecologists most of them I'm, i'm sorry to say that but most of the corporate gynecologists are kind of exploiting women and um, making it convenient for them i've seen a uh, gynecologist who has done a c section just because she has to go attend a party so where this woman was nicely dilating around 6 7 cm she said the baby's heart rate is dipping this that created a big ruckus around and did a c section just because she had to step out for a party so this is what is wrong the trust factor uh, this is where um, you know the gynecologists are losing the trust because one case two cases like this happen and then the word of mouth spreads or the google it spreads and that's where the women stop really trusting the other gynecologists for really pro natural birthing otherwise definitely women do trust their doctors more than they trust themselves um, any other questions sorry. but i think before we go to the next question or later on fatima maybe you know if you can relay like a specific instance you know or example um because it, it is an important issue i think and i'm sure many physicians i mean let, we talk about with midwifery care but let's face it we do not have enough midwives in the country yes. to provide midwifery care for everybody so we are looking at changing the way ob's are practicing right, <coughs> as well that has to happen i mean midwifery care can be practiced by other people than midwives So um maybe if you can speak a little more specifically to um this issue that you're talking about I think it's a profession I mean you have to have the passion to be a good practitioner in Bangalore we don't have midwives we obstetricians believe in natural birth and I practice like a midwife I just don't the hat of an obstetrician when something goes wrong what's wrong in that we don't have midwives i think another generation to have but we obstetricians can become midwives when they say trust i think the 9 months is there to build the trust and i i have women who will change the doctor because she didn't like a word that somebody said but it's not like that trust is understanding your doctor and as we understand the patients so just because i'll tell you women come with a insurance card unlimited insurance they don't like something they hop to another doctor this is not what is trust building when i say trust it was both the ways there are instances where i have told my patient that you know i'm not comfortable with you you're not trusting me so you know we spend a lot of time in building that trust i mean we are not some mercenaries i'm there to offer my service and i believe i'm going to do best for my patient so i think you have to see from the obstetrics point of view as well that we are trust building and the woman should take it up if she is not happy with something ask questions i think the women who come to us most of them are the google goers i also go to a place where you know by choice they don't have money so they come to that place it's run by a mutt they women don't know anything they they trust that i will do the best and both wherever i work i think our outcomes are the same because they trust us whenever i when she pays me or she doesn't pay me so i think that is trust building so the women have a responsibility also to create that rapport with me so when i say trust that is very important you know you have a baby you want to deliver but you have to give your caregiver that trust so i think that point goes missing when we all demand that you know we should be looked after well but you have to give that trust to your caregiver anybody you want to add to that maybe not just yeah please um i think sorry um i i hear your pain um no i i tell you why because I'm someone who had a baby. I trusted my OBGYN. Um I think in the larger scheme of things and I've spoken with my friends about this earlier. 
all said and done, the reason why I had a normal birth, not a natural birth, but a normal birth, a vaginal birth, was because, to a great extent, because of her guidance, right? At the same time, today, when I, when I sit in a forum like this, uh, when I think of, why didn't I ever pick up the phone and find out where I could go to a Lama's class? Or why didn't I ever try to find out if I could get hold of a doula? Uh, I, I, heard, I read about birth plans. I was the quintessential Google goer. Um, I went back and asked questions. I was told, don't read too much. Very nicely, but told that. I still kept reading and I kept going back and my strategy changed to say, I know you're going to scold me for this, but I'm still going to ask you this question, right? And she figured that, okay, this one is going to ask questions, so I might as well answer it. I think the whole thing about trust is, is what uh, Madhavi talked about as well. It's commendable that we have someone like you sitting in the room who says, I'd rather, even if I am an OB, I would rather play the midwife role for most of the time when an OB role is not required. Unfortunately, unfortunately, very sadly so, there aren't a lot of OBs who would say that. That's the tragic part of it. That's one part of it. The other part of it, and which I also have a question for the panel, is what uh, Dr. Lata talked about, this whole thing of the barrier in the minds of the women and their families. I have to be attended to by a doctor, and not just by a doctor, by the senior doctor. I felt, went through that hierarchy myself. So there were times when the senior doctor would not be available. Her, the lady who was training, also a doctor with enough experience uh, with her, would see me and then she'd say, oh, okay, yes, wait, doctor will see you. And till the doctor saw me, in, during every visit, I'd be like, is she really going to see me? Am I going to go away after I'm meeting this lady only? There is no basis whatsoever for that question. There was nothing that that so-called junior doctor did that would make me feel like this was less than. But I did. And I'm saying, I, I really would like to hear from you know, people in the panel, how are you breaking this barrier? Because this is, and I'm sure this is not just India, we are very hierarchical, we are very class conscious, but I think that's true the world over in different ways. And uh, the question I have really is this whole thing of trust building, how do you do that? And how do you actually change the perception of some of the people who come in? So um, I think trust is a true way, two-way street. And I think as a society, there needs to be that raising of that consciousness. When we started, we, there was nothing, right? So it was when people would come, we would have to explain what midwifery is. And still, many of them would, would choose to maybe you know, stay with us for care, but many of them would choose to go back to the OBGYN. And even currently, there are, there are people who will come. We are primary care providers, so people will come. But they, they, they are looking for that doctor-oriented model of care many of the times. But I also do think that there are a couple of things that I want to bring up. One is Google is like a part of our lives. If I have something today, I do Google it. So I can't wish it to go away. And yes, I think that, that we have to be cognizant that people will come in with knowledge, with information. And yes, there are the, you know, the people who may not want to do that, but most of us will. Um, that's one part. The other part is, I think, how do we listen to women's voices? I think I bring, bring up this in the context of a an emergency physician who landed up giving birth with me, and she landed up changing care to me in um, the 39th week of her pregnancy. She was having pregnancy-induced hypertension since week 28, and she was then in the same hospital where she was an emergency physician. The head of the obstetrics obstetrics department was taking care of her. But her questions were never answered. So why do I need to take this? She is, she, and she says very clearly that I save lives. And at the drop of a hat, I know when I need to you know, do something to save a life. But to me, my questions were never answered. Why do I need to take a medicine? What do I need to do? I, she, she cut off her emergency care shifts. She landed up going on a lower you know, work routine, so on and so forth. But eventually, when she found out about us, she was in week 36. Now, 
she didn't come necessarily to change care to me at that time. She came to explore what is it that our model of care can offer her because she really wanted that natural birth. In her words, she says, I was in love with natural birth. And as a woman, I felt that that was what I wanted to do. But in the medical model of care, in the obstetric model of care, with pregnancy-induced hypertension, I was not being given a chance. So fast forward, finally she meets with me and I said, you know, if you're going to birth with me, these are the things that we need in place. I need you to meet my backup ob -GYN. I need you to get a physician consult. We need you to be on better blood pressure control. It was not controlled the day I met her. And she was really not taking many medicines. She was still trying to figure out because the natural part of her was wanting to do certain things. And anyway, long story short, she does not meet with me again for two weeks. I am at a conference when she calls me and she says, I know, and she writes a long letter, which I still have kept. And it goes over two pages. And I read it three times and I had tears in my eyes, and I said, how can I not accept this woman back under my care? And what she was looking for, because that particular day, three people had called her and said that she was putting her baby at risk, and a baby would die if she would not come back and have a cesarean section. So here is an emergency care physician who says, I'm not a criminal. I want the best outcome for me and my baby, but I want my voice heard. I want a place which will tell me what are the pros and what are the cons and let me make decisions for myself and let then if, if you feel that there is a true emergency I am not a fool and this is a highly educated medical professional so eventually at 39 weeks she comes she takes classes she does what she needs to do gets her blood pressure under control and of course it was a complete collaborative effort but she had a baby naturally and the first thing she did when she looked at her baby, she said, I went through all this and I never knew you could be so beautiful and give me this fulfillment. So again, we are looking at what does a woman want? If she wants to be respected, we have to give her the pros, we have to give her the cons. Informed consent, informed refusal, both have to be taken care of. And if we cannot give her the choice to make an informed refusal, what are we doing? Because it is her body that we are talking about. Yes, we are in a unique position as obstetricians and midwives. We are taking care of two lives. It is very clear to me that at that point, it is me and whoever, or the people who are providing are responsible for it. But that trust has to be built over a period of time. And if I had said to her, you need a cesarean right now, she would not have argued with me. I'm pretty sure about that. But what she wanted was the feeling of trust and respect and care. And the other one small thing that I do want to say is about also the importance of this collaboration that whenever we need it, because we just had a VBAC after two cesarean sections yesterday. The second cesarean section happened, the first one was completely not required, non-needed non C-section. The second C-section happened with us. She came to us was in labor, good strong labor, uterus acting, everything going well. But after a point of time, there was she had severe every two to three minute apart contractions, but absolutely no progress. Now with that, we went in and what did we find? We found that everything was completely adhered. Every layer of her uterus was clustered to her anterior abdominal wall, all those things. And her obstetrician at that point said, well, this would never have happened. You know, and that at that point there was neither a risk to the mom's life nor the baby's life, but that was what she needed. And this time around, she landed up coming back to us and having a vaginal birth. So each 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 mother who touches us, she gives us a reason to believe that there is something in her. And she told me in this labor that the pains are not the same this time. So there is a lot of evidence that goes into what the practices are. And as obstetricians, as midwives, we look at the holistic picture. And yes, I think we need to trust women to make choices for themselves. Can I answer the lady's question? Yeah. She wants to, uh, she wants to answer. Okay, I'll answer. Yeah. Which are going on with midwives. So they are midwives. We have 
we have nursing and midwifery training in India at all levels, like we have primary care providers and we are preparing independent midwifery practitioners also. But unfortunately, it is that what we have discussed, like Madam has said that we don't have practice laws. And that is how nobody comes forward because it is uh, the same way, like the obstetrician is having fear that who will take the risk for the life. Because it is not ultimately that we want uh, to establish our practice, but it is that we want to save lives also. We cannot risk somebody's lives just to uh, enhance or maybe establish our practices. And that is what is we are striving for. Like we are looking for the government to make the rules for practice. And if they are there, the syllabus and everything that the Indian Nursing Council has described, uh, the theoretical and practical aspects that we have into our syllabus, are enabling us to provide the medical care which is required for the normal births. Which is, uh, we have seen that it is a physiological birth which is not complicated with medical elements, as Priyanka had said rightly, that uh, we can definitely provide care to the women who are low risk groups. But unfortunate is that, that nobody is there to support us as Madam Nipita has done. Or maybe uh, I, uh, Vijaya could start with. And that is uh, where the problem comes. We have a lot of midwives and yes, of course, uh, as uh, a few times back she said that uh, obstetricians can take the role of midwife. But if the obstetrician supports midwives, I think that will be a great, great thing because uh, for the low profile women or where the obstetrician could not reach. Still, uh, we had so many conference and we had one AM from Kuranda district of Pune. She is delivering 30 to 40 women a month where no obstetrician could reach. It is a tribal area and she is delivering all those women. She is the only doctor available there, we can say in a short. And she has saved so many lives that her center, uh, even her efforts were recognized by the national uh, labels and in, uh, she is awarded Florence National Award uh, this May. So, uh, means the confidence and competence is there, but unfortunately, there is no support which we require from the legal systems. So, I think uh, this forum will help us to get that. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, please. I think yeah. that would be good to hear from. Thank you, Sujata. Uh, no, I just want to go back to the young lady who spoke about the hierarchy and how do you build trust. And um, I, I, I come from a background where I firmly believe obstetric or an obstetric practice cannot be a solo practice. It has to be a team based on evidence guidelines and everybody speaks the same language. So a woman, when she comes into that environment, should feel safe, number one. Because I can't be available 24-7. I'd be a lousy doctor if I was, because I'd be very tired, and I would end up doing probably unnecessary cesareans because I'm far too tired. Once I got the team together, then you sell your team. Today. Uh, we ask when we have a low risk mother and she comes to me, I say, would you like to see our midwife? Would you like to have a natural birth? Why don't you attend our classes? And you book her to see a, a midwife. So if you are convinced of your team, you sell them. It gives me absolute delight, I'm, I'm, I'm an unending pleasure to walk through the hospitals and nobody recognizes me. Because that is the way we ought to be working. Uh, I am a firm believer of that. I, I hope I've answered your question. Quite often, mothers, they don't want to see the doctor. They're quite happy. And now with Indy there and leading a midwife uh, OP, we also tell them, go and see the midwife. And you're happy to be along with her. You don't have to come back to us. Please continue your care with the midwife. If you ask me what I visualize for India, I visualize a day when every woman who's pregnant sees a midwife first, and only if required sees a doctor. That's what we are aiming for at Fernandez.
please. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I've been here for two years. Um, and as a professional midwife in the UK and coming to India, it's such a vast difference. And it's, it's, it's sad. It's sad because uh, Indian mothers are not uh, given the chance and, the, and for healthcare professionals to let mothers believe in their ability to birth. So in the first thing, mothers birth. Mothers don't deliver. Pizzas are delivered. That's the first thing. And, and, the, and the second thing as well, uh, what makes me sad is you're all very privileged to be in this room. So you're all here, you have Google. Think about the mothers in the institutions where we are actually doing some training. And these mothers, they, they're not aware. They're not aware of their rights. They're not aware of what to expect. And the cesarean section rate where we're training is 70%. And among, let me tell you. For first time mothers. For first time mothers. 71%. Seven and this is first time mothers. And it's going to be a huge public health issue. Because what's going to happen? They do um, um, cesarean sections for, they, there's no VBACs, there's no inductions. Uh, mothers are not even given the ability to birth the moment they reach 39 weeks. And very often, below 37 weeks without a clear indication, they're having a cesarean section. So that's impacting on the babies, that's impacting on outcomes and public health. And it's really, really disheartening. The, the second thing is, um, when you look at the, uh, um, it's, it's sad because you have traditional birth attendants, you have a &Ms, g &Ms, and you have professional midwives, and it's very confusing. The word midwifery is used very liberally. I'm not saying that we're not playing a part, but when you attend the Human Rights Conference now two years ago now, the midwives are saying that they don't have enough of training. Now, don't mothers deserve a right to have a trained professional <laughs> looking after her? Come on, we are in 2018, and our maternal mortality is 174 per 100,000. In my country, it's under 10. And that's not right. These deaths are preventable. So why are we, we as a country, and in India doesn't even have a baseline of professional midwives. Why is that? We went through this in the UK, and in 1924 to 1936, we, the, the government says, okay, anybody who deals with birthing mothers needs to be trained. And that happened. And this is what India needs to do now. India needs to wake up. You have mothers who are dying as preventable. Start with the baseline. We don't even have a baseline. obstetrician delivers the same low risk, you know, they have to pay more while the midwife delivers. So it is a very political, economic thing which started and then I think we are not clever enough to have adopted it. I think that's a problem. All I know is that women need to need to start somewhere. You, you, um, women need to start the revolution. And there are many of us professionals who will be part of that movement. We are here to support you. But unless women demand, scream, stamp their feet, hold hands, and start creating that movement and demanding, you know, we need this kind of care. We need these professionals. We want it. It's our basic human right. Things won't happen. Because wherever major decisions have been made and change has happened, it's been led by women. Yeah. And, and you're right, like yes. Vijaya, you said that the mother was saying, if you don't do this, my baby will die. The language that healthcare yeah. professionals use, oh, right. you're only three centimeters dilated. How does a mother feel? You've got an incompetent cervix. How will the mother feel? Failure to progress. How will the mother feel? It's the language that we use unknowingly that's really psychologically damaging for women. Women need to celebrate. Women need to own their births. But do we give them the opportunity to do that? I don't think so. The language that we use, 
Why do we do certain procedures? Why do we need the light when we're doing a vaginal examination? Why? What, what do you need to see? Because a mother actually, in the UK, we, had, we opened up a clinic for sexual survivors, and mothers actually say it unknowingly. Why do you need to, to put the light to healthcare professionals? Because it made her feel violated again. Women who've been abused tend to go through the abuse when they come back to the pregnancy period. And unknowingly, the language that we use, one woman said, a healthcare professional said, be gentle and it'll be over. And those were exactly the same words that the rapists had used. So we really need to be very careful with the language that we use. So now you know what Indy has done to us at our hospital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also one more thing which you mentioned, which we generally, this is because I think majority of the women here are women, they don't know visiting doctors and we have a fascination with the specialist doctor we have to accept that we like the high profile doctor we like the gucci bag we like the attire we like the walk we like the style we like good looking people this is how we are but sometimes we fail to see. For example, even on my team, I have a nurse, she's very excited to join the birth center. When I talk about her experience, she talks about how she worked in Africa for 10 years not knowing if they're HIV positive or not. She has way more experience out there. It's just that sometimes, unfortunately, in the last 40 years, the onslaught of English has been very big in this country. A lot of our nurses and obviously nurse midwives may not speak Oxford English. But that does not mean they are any less in skill. Yep. They're not any less. They may not speak like us. They may not be vocal. May, they, may not, they may not even know what is the apps and things like that. But they are no less in skill. In fact, they might be way more kinder than what we imagine them to be. It's just that they're always pushed aside, you know? What we call bullying at workplace, all this, and subordinated day in and day out, that they just lose it. That's it. They may not be reading journals because, uh, again, this is also documented. 45% of, as per the WHO report in 2016, midwives' voices, they say 45% of them are exhausted out. You know, they're tired and exhausted out. There's even 20% that is working on other jobs to supplement incomes. This is another issue altogether. So I think we really need to look beyond English. We need to connect with other care providers because they might actually know more in the real sense of the word. Right. You wanted to make a comment, right? Yeah, yeah. It's about the language and the trust. Yeah. So you mentioned how the, the, the language that is used is, is um, so demeaning. I mean, and that's not only at the time of birth. Even now, OK, so during my first, just to give you a little background, my first uh, Birth, I was sailing through until 38 weeks. I had no complications, none whatsoever. And around the 38th week, around the 38th week, I was told that I might, I might have to start preparing, or maybe it's 37th week, that I would have to start preparing for a cesarean. I was so disheartened and I was so determined that I did not want to go through this. I saw five doctors. I mean, through the whole pregnancy, I've seen five. After that, I saw three. And, and, and we took a call based on, and I was the first first time mother, so I, I mean, there was that fear, I was not sure. Uh, three, uh, two out of the three doctors said, why would you even, you know, show any kind of distrust to the doctor? Why would you se uh, second guess his or her uh, decisions? You just have to go with the cesarean. And that, that's how I ended up in that. But I was depressed for the longest time. I've still not come to terms with that. So. So, so we went to three doctors. The, the, the first one was a regular doctor we consulted, and he was the one who said there's fetoplasm. Yeah. The and then so we went to a second doctor for a second opinion, and he found no fault at all. He said, no, oh, it's perfectly normal. It's a perfectly normal condition, so you don't need to do a C-section. Now that we have two doctors saying diametrically opposite things, so they're most trust, right? <laughs> and so we go to a third doctor who doesn't even do a check, and she just says, no, if a doctor says something, you just trust them. And so he has one doctor saying, you lose your child if you don't do this. So yeah. then there's a fear factor. Yeah. yeah, no, and these were the top three rated doctors in Pune that I met. That, 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 that did not work. Secondly, the, the language of was, yeah, if something goes wrong, uh, it's on you. I mean, if the child dies, it's on you. That was, I was, I was at the receiving end of that. 
that was my first pregnancy. Now I am eight weeks pregnant. I go. I, I'm. I'm on the. On the. I'm. I mean, on the lookout for a doctor for the longest time. I've met two doctors. I've, so one of them tells me my simple question was, I got my um, blood work done, and I did not. I wanted to go the natural way, where I did not want to take supplements. So I all my levels are normal. My simple question to the doctor was, in spite of that, do I need to take any kind of supplements? The doctor said, see, you have to take it. I'm not prescribing. I, I have experience. I'm not prescribing it. Uh, so that you don't take it if you haven't already started and if something happens to your child, if he develops any kind of neural uh, problems, it's on you. How am I supposed to trust any, I mean, I, when your trust is abused at every stage, the language used is, is against you. Like Beauty also said, I mean, you know that the system is against you. What are you, if Google is not against you, you know that much. I mean, I, I don't know, they don't have time. Yeah, so that's, you know, you know, it's, it's such a struggle, I call you, in fact, yeah, that's a different story, yeah, I will, I will. So I, uh, unfortunately, I moved from this side of Bangalore to the other side, to North Bangalore, and I'm having such a hard time, otherwise, I mean, to find a doctor, but this is the story, it's, it's very, very hard. It's, I, ha it, I have, I've met seven doctors so far, OB, and in all the bigger hospitals, and I have run into no luck so far. Like they are trained into only midwifery skills and 
they are trained to handle all the emergencies that may arise out of a normal labor. So that is how uh, we are also trying to get into. Uh, definitely in India also we provide that education into how to handle and manage emergencies, how to identify high risk cases and refer them. But yes, there are like, uh, as we say, that not all institutions are good enough to provide care and provide the practice experience to their students. It happens in medical field as well as in nursing field, the same way it is going on. To regulate that irregularity, which is coming uh, nowadays, uh, we are looking forward to propose uh, something which will you know, help us to uh, objectively uh, see a person <coughs> as a competent midwife. Like you have trusted Vijaya and uh, somebody trusts Priyanka. Because they have done it in the setting where it has been very uh, strictly monitored, which is not in the case in our country, sadly. But there are midwives, as Priyanka has said, that they, uh, some are working with uh, long years of experience. They are competent enough to provide care. And they are not coming forward because the practice law is not there. So that is what we are pushing forward. If the practice law is there, definitely there will be strict regulations and monitoring that will be done for the practices of the midwives. And then that is how we will be able to you know, put forth uh, the professional midwives. <coughs> Sorry, I just, okay. just a quick thing, I think to answer Janvi also and then to also talk about Sujata. I think two things need to be done. One is, of course, that the, the existing, you know, competencies of what the, whether it's the ANMs or the GNMs, basically the, this is, these are the auxiliary nurse midwives and the graduate nurse midwives. They, because we have approached it from a nursing standpoint, well, I just believe very strongly that those people can be trained into becoming the kind of midwives that the woman needs. See, my one issue, I think, where we, we have to look at it strongly is the where you have been trained, even for those who have had the curriculum competencies, you're being trained in the same um, you know, medical model of care. So if you, if we as midwives have all got to come together and provide similar kinds of care, and yes, it can be in different settings. Birth can happen anywhere. It can happen in a hospital. Again, it's what Dr. Evita said. The woman has to feel safe. Some women will say feel safe only in a hospital with a doctor. Some women will want to birth at home. Some women will want to birth, you know, and we have, uh, and rightly it's been pointed out in rural areas, people may not have a choice. So I think we need to have identify as to where the lacunae are and raise up the level of midwifery as to standing with women. Without that, we are still providing and saying, okay, if I say, yes, this ANM has 12 years of experience, she may have birthed 500 babies, you know, in the rural areas because other medical support was not available. <coughs> Let's not lose that skill. Let's take that skill up, but then up, upskill her a little bit into getting those core, core competencies to provide that while with women may be free. And I think Dr. Evita has done a bit of that and in this, in this process, and he has helped with the rural training. So I think one one aspect would be to give that extra 18 months or whatever of training to the existing midwives and get their clinical skills and competencies up. The other thing would be to again try to push for this direct entry midwifery because many of these women who come into the direct entry midwifery may not have a scientific background but they have the passion. So I think they're coming at it with life experiences, they're coming at it with skills and if we can get those women who are coming into the to it with some good curriculum uh, and get the legislation involved with that to accept maybe free as an independent profession. That would be great. That's an important question. Do you want to speak about that as well? Nursing and direct entry, direct entry, direct entry. Yeah. 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 So um, I do agree with all the points that Vijay has said. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind about direct entry. I think it's really important because I've always seen um, midwifery free and nursing as separate. Um, it's really important to, and this is how the world works, right? This is, I know in India we have a lot, a long way to go, but the world definitely works like that. We must have different cadres of midwives in this country, uh, hospital-based, um, independent midwives, all different categories. I do feel that um, the time is right to implement the curriculum and move things forward in that direction.
Uh, that, that was a very important point raised, Jamie, and we feel very strongly about the need for regulation, standardization of curriculum, because as everybody agrees here, every woman should be offered the best care and support. So the midwife has to be highly skilled, competent and confident. I'm working with the government of India who actually is ready to push professional midwifery across the country. We're trying to get the government to understand one thing. You cannot cut corners on the quality of training because politicians want fast. And when we say minimum 18 <coughs> months, ICM is International Confederation of Midwives. And the definition of a midwife has to be strictly adhered to. And so therefore, you've got to have a professional who has these core competencies as outlined by the ICM. So it becomes a kind of a global bar that we've set for ourselves. We're also trying to work with the government and say direct midwifery is also required in this country. And I agree, because over the last few years I've met various women who've joined and become professional midwives, as Vijaya says, because of different experiences. But that doesn't diminish nurses who go through focused training in midwifery and practice only midwifery. So the government at the moment is poised for this, but our fears are, will we dilute the standard of training? We need regulation. We need strict laws that control what we do, because ultimately we are dealing with two lives. And we shouldn't at any stage be settling for anything less. Again, women need to demand. I just have one. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, before I go to the question I have for Mandy, I just quickly like to say my experience and a couple of things. Uh, but I was a first time mother in 2016, and my very obvious choice then was uh, the doctor who delivered, who helped my mother deliver us 35 years ago. So I went with, I blindly trusted her. There was no doubt of trust here. And so I was back with the same doctor after 35 years. She has seen us as babies. And I'm there as a mother, as a to-be mom. Um, so the journey of nine months was great, and uh, I had no complications whatsoever. Uh, but during labor, the whole story was different. Uh, I ended up in a C-section with the same doctor who was 35, who treated my mom 35 years ago. So with this, I'd like to quickly ask a question to the panel. There's something that has changed over time. It is the same person, the same system, the same doctors, or the same qualification. But something has changed over time. Are we able to recognize what is the root cause here? What has changed over time? Uh, one thing that always comes to my mind is the growth, the phenomenal growth in the pharmaceutical industry. There has been a phenomenal growth there, but definitely it comes with its pros and cons. But uh, that is one thing I've always uh, felt. Uh, a drastic growth in pharmaceutical companies has somewhere uh, contributed to this drastic change. Um, you might as well like uh, disagree with that, or I'm not sure. This is just a bit of and uh, you know uh, my my thoughts and opinions. But I'd like to understand what has changed over the years. I think if we try to find out that root cause, because we already know what we want in place to make the birth. Um, more accepted by the family and the mother, but how can to change those or meet those barriers or rectify those barriers? We need to understand what caused this change in the first place. I think we never we never even had a formula for that matter 60 years ago, 50, 60 years ago. And now that's quite common. Breastfeeding is it's, it's, it's hardly uh, you hardly hear know of mothers who breastfeed. So you're just going back to the same practices. Something has changed over time. So I'd just like to know if there's something that any of you would like to share. Um, obstetric practice.
practice has changed over time due to various reasons. <clears throat> One is the medical legal battle that doctors are getting into. I'm not saying that you didn't trust your doctor. I'm not talking about your case per se, but medical, medical legal problems. That again boils down to the question of trust that Fatima raised. People are really nervous of um, having, I mean, uh, obstetricians on, on their toes because it is two lives and also anything other than 100% um, I would say success or satisfaction is unacceptable and people can sort of behave in um, <coughs> very unexpected or even violent manner. So that has put the obstetrician on guard, many obstetricians on guard. That's one. The other thing is in the availability of other services like theater, anesthetist, on time, junior doctors to monitor labors, reliable staff or midwives to monitor labors is becoming a big issue. So on the whole, the obstetrician, um, and also the obstetrician has become quite busy. And obstetricians used to live, uh, most of the senior obstetricians used to live just next door or even on the top of the, uh, I mean, the, the uh, topmost floor of the nursing home, no longer. And they have to travel distances. Traffic is a big issue. So lots of changes. Okay, so and also monitoring has become more intense and CTG interpretation has uh, led to um, many cesarean, unwanted cesarean sections, misinterpretation or suboptimal interpretations have led to. Yeah. And also relying on their juniors' findings, et cetera, et cetera, not being able to sort of attend um, or care uh, continuously during, I mean, I wouldn't say continuously, but more frequently visiting the women has become a problem for obstetricians because of many reasons. So all put together, <coughs> the obstetric practice has changed. But one of the fears of late is medical legal uh, for the increasing number of cesarean sections that we have come across. I want to add more to this. Yeah. Uh, as you said, uh, your perspective, ma'am, obstetric practices have changed. But um, I would also want to add to this that um, are the women the same like how your yeah, mom was? Sure. How your mom was prepared? Are you the same now? For them, for the for uh, for my mother. So uh, she gave birth to three children, all naturally, and uh, at home. Okay, and they, for them it was like birthing was a daily routine. Okay, it was never different. Mm. When they were pregnant, they were never treated like the porcelain dolls, like how you guys are being treated yeah, now. Yeah, that's right. They, they used to do all the work. They were physically more prepared, more fit, and I would say more young than what the average age of birthing now is okay so there's a lot of difference even in the women who are birthing and lots of women don't want to take pain they look at pain as a threat they look at pain as a uh, fear they are not looking at pain as a natural process they are not looking at pain of labor as the center of labor you know having pain is a good thing not having pain is not good but they don't want to look at pain as pain. They, they, no, no, I don't want pain. My baby should be born at this time, this day, this star. Okay? So with all that, obviously, the change is there. <laughs> so this has been a great discussion, and I really thank all of you for coming um, and spending your time, choosing to spend your time here with us yes. um, and together. Um, 
as we said, it's really multifactorial, and it's 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 there's no one thing going on. There are many things going on, influencing each other. Not the least of which is privatization of healthcare. India has one of the most privatized systems of healthcare in the world, and, and of education as well. And I think that is also part of the story um, when when health has to be healthcare has to be purchased. And then it has to be a business, and then you know it's different. And it's and, and I don't mean to give a very you know simplistic or facetious comment on that, um, because paying for healthcare is a is a big issue. It's it's very difficult to pay for high quality healthcare. It does cost, but I think we need to um, um, you know kind of as we wrap up on a on a note of really hope and and energy to to change, I think we have to, um, as Indy pointed out, many have pointed out, we have to remember the women who aren't in this room and will maybe never be in rooms like this. That's really important. So it's not just my, my pregnancy and my birth or my choice maybe not to have it. It's, I'm so glad somebody raised that as well, right? Because we get asked that question as well as BBN. Um, what about women who need pregnancy care or abortion care? So this really extends Throughout yeah. healthcare, mm -hmm. I, I mean, we see this throughout healthcare. There's a lot of healthcare that is really not evidence-based, is very disrespectful. Um, and that's an area we just kind of touched upon here a little bit today, but it's very central to the work that I think we all do, really, to to um, one prevent disrespect and abuse, but actively promote um, um, compassion and care and respect. So um, let's not forget that. Tita, can you just close out the program for us? That was some insightful conversation and discussions that we had. Thank you for joining us today and being a part of this momentous conversation. Uh, you can watch and share this event on Lifey at Facebook, thanks to our media partner, Home Screen Network, India's first multi-platform online live stream TV channel. Bangalore Birth Network is doing exceptional work in spreading awareness and promoting evidence-based respectful maternal health care to women from all sections of life. Please do reach out to us with suggestions and feedback that you have, which could better our work. If you would like to help us in our journey and consider making a contribution to our cause, please visit our donation desk and Ellen can help you with the process. Thank you for joining us today and we hope that you will take back the conversation with you to grow and strengthen this movement of course. Thank you.